Assalamualaikum dan selamat datang to Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad and to all our guests who have just joined us today at the tail end of the CEO Forum 2014. And we have come to the finale of today's forum and the theme is surviving the next global financial crisis. We have heard from hosts of renowned speakers on a wide range of subjects from ASEAN to productivity to education and just now, a short while ago, a discussion on industries of high growth and resilience 2015 and beyond with the leaders of EY. And um, from what I have gathered from the plenary session this morning, the outlook in general is not rosy at all and we have been told that we need to brace ourselves to weather the impending storm. So do we have the know-how, the capacity and the readiness? I, for one, would rather err on the side of optimism simply because we have been through it before. They say any experience that does not kill us at the first encounter can only make us stronger on the condition that we learn from the experience. And we are most fortunate that today we have the opportunity to learn from none other than the country's longest serving Prime Minister, a leader who transformed Malaysia and who had helped us see us through many political and economic challenges, including the 1997-98 financial crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite again another big round of applause as I invite Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, the first Prime Minister of Malaysia and the Honorary President of the Dana Leadership Foundation to come on stage to enlighten us, or rather to give us a lecture on leadership and crisis management. Keep us Tun. Thank you to the, for this invitation to speak on, on the theme of surviving the next financial crisis. And the particular subject for me to talk is about leadership and crisis management. I think uh, I know a little about crisis management, but I know a little about crisis management even before I became Prime Minister. It is because as a doctor, we have to manage many crises in the course of our work. People come in a very critical condition, that is they are having a crisis and uh, the duty of a doctor is to handle this critical condition. In other words, to handle the crisis. Now, <clears throat> a doctor has a certain advantage in uh, the management of a crisis. This is simply because the medical course that we do uh, consists of uh, instruction which, uh, with which we should uh, use uh, in order to handle the medical crisis that comes before us every now and again, sometimes in the dead of night. But we survive because we have been told that uh, the way to, be, to manage a crisis is to be systematic. When a doctor is faced with a crisis, he spends a little bit time, sometimes to the consternation of the relatives, to find out what actually is a crisis. Because without knowing what the crisis is all about, it will not be possible for you to handle it. In this uh, matter, 
we have to accept the truth and not try to deny the truth. The first step, of course, is to find out what is the patient suffering from. And to do this, we begin with a study of the history behind the sickness. The history holds a lot of information uh, which would be necessary, which, which would help us make a diagnosis. Of course, we have to ask the patient how he feels, what started him on this uh, problem that he's facing, uh, what are his feelings about it, what, what about whether they have a temperature or they have a running nose or they may have uh, diarrhea. All this information is very important in the preliminary stage of trying to solve the crisis so as to begin to identify what the problem is about. So I went through this because it is almost automatic for a doctor when faced with a person who is sick to go through this process of getting the history. And when you get the history, you cannot deny uh, what is obviously true. You cannot say, well, it cannot be this, but it is that, because you don't like to admit that this patient is actually suffering from a disease that will end with his passing away very soon. If you keep yourself to saying that maybe it is not that, but something less uh, severe. But in handling a crisis, it is important to face the facts, to get the data correctly. If you have all the data that you can gather about the background to the crisis, then you are well on the way to diagnosing what's ailing the patient or what is ailing the economy or the country or the finances of the country. Get as many details as possible and categorize them if you can. Now the next stage for a doctor is to examine the patient. And examination means putting your hands on the body of the patient, listening to his heart, his lungs, and all sorts of other things that you need to know about the patient to determine his illness. Following that, we do what we call lab tests, sending samples to the lab to be analyzed, to grow bacteria or whatever. And with that information, you come nearer to making a diagnosis. Then, of course, in these days, we have uh, x-rays, CAT scan, uh, and all kinds of new appliances which uh, give you further information on what the patient is suffering. And putting all this information together and maybe consulting with others, you arrive at the conclusion or arrive at diagnosis of what the patient is suffering from. And from then onwards, of course, it's a question of what medication, there will be choices, and you have to make a choice to demand, uh, determine whether he needs surgical procedures, or he needs just uh, medicine by mouth, or is it intravenous. This is what I was taught in medical school. And when I became prime minister, I found that this procedure, this systematic examination of information gathering of information is very useful in order to deal with crisis which is not medical. And of course, the classic one is dealing with the 1997-98 financial crisis. I was not a finance man, I was not a banker, and of course, I had to read up on all these things in order to understand the briefings given by the officer's concern. Now, you can be brief on a lot of things, but if you don't understand, uh, it's not going to be very useful. So I read up on banking, I read up on finance, and 
I began to understand a little bit about finance. I don't deal with uh, investments. I don't have a single cent in the stock market. Uh, nor do I double with uh, investments in uh, any of the companies. Uh, so I had to learn a lot about these things to understand what is happening to the country. And sure enough, I got the history. The history and the background of the crisis that I was faced with and the country was facing. Uh, I gathered as much as possible this information. And of course, I had numerous briefings. And with this, I then proceeded to examine physically what is happening. In other words, I had to know what's happened to the economy of the country, the finances of the country, why are we going through this uh, recession, uh, what, what is the wrong thing that we have done, or maybe the wrong things that others have done. And following that, of course, I was uh, able to reach some conclusion and to refine the conclusion further and to think about how the crisis could be managed and turn around. So the procedure, as you can see, is very much like a doctor trying to diagnose a patient. So if you ask me about leadership and crisis management, I cannot advise you to become a doctor. It's a bit too late. But I should advise you to learn about the methods of the doctors. They go through a very uh, a, a set of procedures which leads to their ability to recognize and diagnose the problem. Of course, after that comes the, uh, uh, the treatment that has to be given. That, of course, is another problem. But in the crisis of 1997-98, I had great difficulty in understanding it because I knew very little about finance and very little about banking. I was shocked to find that bankers actually lend money which they don't have. <laughs> Any banker here who wants to deny that? Well, when, once they lend money, it becomes their assets. How nice. You have nothing, and you lend nothing, and you, you, it becomes your asset. And I think if anybody wants to do business, banking is the best business you can do. <laughs> now, everybody does it. I'm not blaming them. I think they have a need to create money uh, or else, if we depend upon the money that is issued by the government, there's, there is just not enough of it. So somebody has to create money, it may be the central bank, but the banks themselves, in a way, create money. Because when they lend you money, uh, it is money that frequently they don't possess. Of course, they do possess some money, capital invested in the banks, and the deposits in the bank and other assets, but the amount that people want to borrow from the bank often exceed the amount of money that the bank has. So the bank has to create money. You know, this is a very powerful instrument. Uh, how much money can you create? I read one book which says that it can be 10 times the amount of money that is deposited with the bank. Just imagine. Somebody lends you $1 million, you can lend out $10 million. That's good business. But that is the way things are. And we need that money. But when banks uh, felt that, why should they stick at 10 times? Why not 11 times? Why not 20 times? And so they created uh, a new term for Lending, they call it leveraging. Leveraging is about, well, lending money that you don't have, basically. See, that is the advantage of the banks. So, 
once it is known that they can actually uh, lend unlimited amount, practically unlimited amount of money, then the hedge funds move in to take advantage. The currency traders also move in to take advantage of this, of this ability to borrow almost unlimited sums of money from the banks. This was what I learned. You can refute what I say, but uh, that time I learned and I believe that this was the way things were. Because how could they have so much ringgit to sell in which before they don't seem to have? And I discovered that they didn't have any ringgit. What they did was to borrow ringgit from the banks in order to, to buy or to sell. And the banks can lend money, a lot of money to them, because the banks can create money. And, and so the currency traders and the hedge funds have at their, uh, at their call almost any amount of money. Now the idea is this, that if somebody deposits one million dollars with you, you can then lend 10 million, but 20 million would be better, 30 would be even better, 30 times more. So if you have 10 million, or you have 1 million, you want to invest directly, your capital is only 1 million. But if you invest through hedge funds or with currency traders by the banks, then that one million now becomes 30 million. Obviously, if you invest 30 million, you're going to get 30 times more the profit or the dividends than if you invest one million. That is why people invest through hedge funds and maybe the currency traders too. They were able to have a lot of money with which to play. And when you have a lot of money to play, you know how the market behaves. When you buy a share repeatedly, the value goes up. And when you sell repeatedly, the value goes down. Obviously, if you keep on buying, you push it up, and then you dump the shares, you can make a lot of money because now you have shares which is highly valued. And when you dump the shares, somebody else will have to carry the burden of shares which have become depreciated. The man who used the hedge fund stands to gain a lot, and of course they divide the spoils between the hedge funds and the investor, the depositor of them. That was how it was working, and that's uh, informed me or made clear to me that uh, the amount of money they have is really nothing. They were creating money to buy or to sell the ringgit. They didn't have a cent. You know, money today comes to you in many forms. It comes to you as a check mainly. When you borrow money, a million dollars or ten million dollars from a bank, they don't give you cash, one million or ten million, it will be difficult for you to carry out of the bank and you could be robbed. They only enter the figure as um, a money that is lent to you which you can draw whenever you like. So no cash involved. And then when you pay somebody, you also write a check, no cash involved, and the check goes to the bank and the bank now does not pay out the, in real money. The banks merely write down to your credit or your account that now you have paid in so much money. Actually, cash is not necessary. You write, write checks and today, of course, you have credit cards and all kinds of new money, which is not uh, uh, produced or printed by the government. So money today 
takes many forms and allows itself to be manipulated. So the currency traders raise money in this way. They depress our currency by selling it repeatedly. And then when it is um, low enough, they will then start buying the currency and the currency will appreciate and they make money after the appreciation. It's a very simple system of impoverishing other countries. So I learned about this and I was very annoyed and very angry. I would have punched Mr. Soros in the nose if I got him. But I did say nasty things about him because it is unfair to do this to a country that is just coming up. We were just coming up and when they devalued our currency by 50%, we became half, we became poorer to that amount. We, if we are, uh, we have a million, that million is worth in terms of purchasing power only 500,000 ringgit or dollar or whatever. They were impoverishing us and I thought this was gross, grossly unfair. Now, I need to understand completely the mechanism. If you are dealing with a crisis, you must meet, have a full knowledge of the mechanism that led to the crisis. So I read a lot, I tried to understand. And then uh, when you are faced with a sick person, you want to restore him to health. How do you do it? Of course, you have to give him medicine, you have to chop him up sometimes, remove one leg or the other. Nasty things, but you have to do it if you are going to manage the crisis. So how do we manage this financial crisis? Uh, we thought that they were selling and buying our ringgit. Obviously, if they cannot sell and they cannot buy our ringgit, they cannot play around with it. And how, we, how do we stop them? Well, the way to stop is, of course, fortunately for us, the central bank in Malaysia is very powerful. He can direct the banks operating in Malaysia that no transaction should be carried out where the, the money that is uh, deposited or withdrawn is not for something legal. If it is merely in order to depress the price of the ringgit or to increase the value of the ringgit, they should not accept uh, this uh, transfer of the account from the seller to the buyer. Once you stop that, they couldn't play around with the money. So you can see the process. You have to know you have to know what ails the uh, economy or the finances and understanding it, you then think of a medicine or a way to reverse the process. If it is because they are selling the money, then we stop them from selling the money. If they are buying the money, we stop them from buying. Once we do that, the, the disease was practically cured. Uh, now you are seeing a financial crisis that has uh, ailed Europe and America for the last eight years. Eight years and they still cannot resolve the financial crisis. They are still having problem. Now their problem is because they reject history. They reject the information that they receive. They are in a state of denial when it is pointed out to them that the financial market is being manipulated. Well, some of them made tons of money manipulating the financial market. They are not about to say this is wrong, this is illegal, and it must be stopped. Some people were making a lot of money through the manipulation, and therefore it should be maintained so that some people can make a lot of money. But the financial market does not create spin-offs. You don't have uh, many uh, small industries supporting the financial market. You don't even need workers. 
if you transact ten billion dollars in the financial market, it doesn't require e even one person to support this. It's just speculative uh, transac transaction. You don't need insurance. You don't need transport. You don't need workers. You don't need uh, ships to carry the money at all. It's all done by electronic transfer, and the re re the result is that the financial market does not support the economy. It doesn't create jobs in particular. Whereas if you are in manufacturing or you are providing service in the hotel, you need a lot of workers. So when you are doing real business, a lot of people will benefit from it. But financial business does not benefit other than the speculator who may make a lot of money, who may lose a lot of money. It is just a small coterie of people. Uh, in America, of course, they are uh, concentrated in Wall Street. And today, of course, they are demonstrating against Wall Street. You may have read in the papers. Because these people are making tons of money, not creating jobs, not helping anybody else except themselves. So if you re refuse to accept this fact, then you cannot handle, you cannot handle the crisis. You have to accept the facts of the case. The signs and symptoms and physical signs, etc. You have to accept that in the financial market, you don't help the economy. You don't help the people. You can transact ten billion dollars without having to employ one other person. But if you have a ten billion dollars manufacturing uh, industry, you will have to employ a lot of people. There would be supporting industries. There would be suppliers. There would be a lot of other people who would be involved if you are involved. If you have an industry that uh, transacts ten billion dollars a year. But in finance, they can go, go to any billions of dollars, to any amount, and yet not spin off supporting industries and not creating any jobs. And of course, if you don't create jobs and you have no supporting industries, the economy will not turn around. You may have a lot of money. Uh, or, or at least in your accounts, they will have, at the banks, the figures will be very big, but only you benefit. The people do not benefit. And if the people do not benefit, you, you will see unhappiness everywhere. Um, today, there are two books. I think one is by Paul Krugman. The other one is by Siglis. Uh, which uh, laments the disparity in income found in the United States. They talk about the 1% percent which owns the economy and the 99% which has no benefit from the economy. And that economy is created by the financial market. There is a great deal of disparity in America today and it is causing a lot of social problems. So if you admit that the financial market does not spin off uh, into a job-creating uh, economy and uh, give employment to others, then it must be wrong. It must be wrong. The solution to that, of course, is to go back to doing real business. What is real business? Well, we borrow money because we have an idea of to manufacture something which we think the public wants to buy and you make a profit of maybe 10% at the most or 5%. But that is good business because your, your industry creates jobs and creates supporting industries and people have money to buy when people have money to buy then, of course, your products will, will be sold and 
the money turns around in the in the society and 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 enriches everyone that is real business real business is about producing things or providing service uh, so that uh, you make some money but in the process a lot of other people will benefit particularly the workers they will benefit but in a financial transaction practically no job is created and there is no spin off into small industries now if you recognize this you recognize that to turn around the economy the management of a crisis uh, of any kind that we meet uh, in in today we need to reduce if not stop altogether the financial market or you need to regulate it uh, you remember that when they were selling de uh, devaluing the ringgit we thought that such activities are are wrong that people should not fiddle around with the ringgit and make us poor uh, of course uh, they said that well this is freedom uh, this is th the right thing to do is the right thing to do because they are making profits from it but when their own country is affected then they should ag admit that the french market contributes much less to society than the real in business of going of of uh, the producing goods and services for the people so if you ask me about leadership and crisis management well the first thing of course is to examine what cause what caused the crisis there must be a cause it doesn't just happen by itself because money suddenly decides to make you poor some people are manipulating the money otherwise there will not be a crisis when you abuse a system any system you are going to get bad results the banking system is very good it creates the capital that you need to make the economy grow but if it is abused by allowing the bank to create unlimited amount of money then of course the abuse will lead to the kind of problem that is being faced by the world during this financial crisis it is well banks of course are very secretive they would don't want to reveal anything about what they are doing uh, we don't even know how much money they are making and how much pay they are paying i understand that during the crisis in england they were paying bonus when the banks were losing money even when they caused the the loss they still get bonus all these things are not right and governments must be prepared to step in uh the glass steagall uh, law and all that has been ab practically abolished or at least not practiced because the pressure coming from this very rich financial people who have more influence on the government than the ordinary ordinary man in the street but to reverse you require a strong leadership to go against the pressures coming from these very rich people in order to legislate to limit the abuses not to limit the functions of the bank but to limit the abuses of the banking system by all means create capital create money because we need the money but don't ever go beyond the limit if you are a strong leader you can say that to the banks and uh, the banks will eventually have to agree with you if you tell the people that it is the banks which are causing us all this trouble and the number of bankers is far less than the number of voters in the country you play up the voters uh, needs i think you will get more support from the voters than if you play to the tune of the bankers so to for a leader to manage manage the crisis he needs to be strong
she needs to be forceful, uh, willful, and determined that he needs to take action even if it's unpopular with certain group. Leaders who do not want to take action will never be able to, find, to handle a crisis. But of course, to take action, the leader must understand the way the crisis is to be handled. And to understand the way you do, you become a doctor. You uh, go through the procedures that doctors uh, go through in order to reach a diagnosis and eventually to provide the medicine. You have to understand how the system works. Leaders today cannot be just uh, good at politics. They have to be good at finance and the, the economy as well. Otherwise, the, the whole thing will, will not work unless you provide good leadership. And good leadership can only come from people who are knowledgeable. You can't have a good leader who is dumb or at least who is very good at being popular but cannot manage crisis. So a good leader must understand not just politics. Politics is about pleasing one group against and winning the other groups and you know becoming popular. In a democracy, you have to be popular. Uh, if uh, I had the privilege of being a dictator, which I was accused of, of course, uh, it would be very easy for me to handle any crisis. I normally line them up against the wall and just shoot them. <laughs> but being an elected leader, I couldn't do that. So I have to find other ways of uh, solving the crisis. And the other ways is really to be educated, to understand the ailment, the problem that you are faced with, and to handle it systematically after you understand it. So we need to educate not just the leaders, but also the people at large. Because people tend to choose leaders because they like his hairdo or like his face or something like that. It's nice. He looks very good in the pictures. But when it comes to a crisis, he may not be able to handle it. Uh, you need a little bit more intelligent uh, and uh, educated leaders. I'm not saying anything against anybody. I'm just making a very, <laughs> I'm making a very general remark because today's world is very complicated. You don't only manage your own country. You have to manage your neighbors and even the people who are far away. Before, it was, life was very simple. We are, we are like an island and uh, uh, what ails us can be solved by us in whatever way we, uh, uh, we can. But today, everybody is looking at us. Even uh, deten detaining people under ISA was regarded as bad. Is it bad? Mm, no answer. Well, we only detain people. They are still alive. We detain people under the ISA. Today, people are passing judgment on absentee criminal and deciding that that criminal should be killed, should be executed. And you can send, nowadays uh, you have drones, you can send the drones and kill the person. I think that is worse than just detaining. At least the detainees are still alive. But the ones you sentenced to death without a hearing, without telling him, you sentenced him to death and you send the executioner to kill him. I think uh, that is worse, worse than uh, our record of uh, keeping all our op opponents in jail. During my time, I, I jail everyone. I detain... <laughs> I'm just repeating what people re are saying about me, so it's quite all right. Now they can't do much to me because I'm no longer the, the Prime Minister. 
Good luck to the Prime Minister. <laughs> I didn't have so much of this problem, but he's having this problem. But uh, I would like to say once again that in dealing, for a leader to deal with a crisis, whether it is financial or it is economic or it is political, the, pro the procedures, the process is the same as that of a doctor dealing with a medical crisis. Know what the crisis is all about. Gather all the data, find out where the weaknesses are and where the strengths are, and then having made a proper uh, assessment of your strengths and your weakness and their strengths and their weakness, make use of your strengths to attack their weakness, weakness, and you have solved the crisis. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know the drill. If you have a question for Tun, just come up to the nearest microphone, identify yourself, and um, present your question as concise as you can. Hello, my name is Pete Meehan. I'm CEO of Electric Angels, one of your early MSE companies. I've been here a long time. I've been here some 17, 18 years, and I can remember exactly what you were talking about. In fact, I got here in 97, and I thought the world was falling apart. There were fires and smoke from Kalamantan. The currency was dropping. Uh, there were shooting pigs. The place was falling apart, or so it seemed. In fact, my family said, you can come back. You can come back to Australia, but I stayed. The thing is, I have watched you for a long time, Tun, and I've truly admired your ability to stay smart, stay focused, and stick to your guns. And I've wanted to ask you this question for a long time, because you've always done things your way. In fact, whenever I hear that great Frank Sinatra tune, I did it my way, I think of you. And, be and perhaps regrets you've had a few, but too few to mention. So my curiosity is how in the face of adversity have you made the ultimate decision? Unlike most of us who just have to make a few decisions for our companies and they may or may not be visible, all of your decisions are highly visible. When you get it right, everyone can see it. When you get it wrong, everyone can see it. There's no hiding from it. But the thing is, you talked about the analysis as a doctor gathering data, and that makes sense to me because you're using a logical MO to approach the decision making. But I'm sure along the way you had people around you that were experts. You had probably people in your cabinet that said go A, and you had people in the cabinet that said go direction B. And of course you had the World Bank whispering in your ear telling you they knew more than you because they had seen it all before and you should be listening to them. And so I always wondered basically how you arrived at your decision points. Was it all analysis or was it part intuition where you sometimes you use gut feel to, to make a decision on these things and ultimately that inner voice that was telling you to do it your way. Thank you. Thank you. Firstly, about this song by Frank Sinatra. I would like to remind you that the first line begins with and now the end is near. <laughs> I thought when they sang that song to, well, to praise me perhaps, it is because they, I think they were trying to remind me that it's about time you step down. And now, of course, when they say the end is near, it is very near. <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, uh, well, a person who leads must accept that he has no monopoly of wisdom. He needs to have people around him, people who will inform him about the real situation, and he must check on them. Because information that comes to a leader is not always because uh, it is good for the leader. It is good for the informant. Uh, he wants to get something out of it. 
So you have to see through to find out what is uh, proper, what is real, what is true, as against uh, some attempt to, you know, to gain your uh, endorsement of what he wants to do. So I listen to a lot of people, and as I said, I read a lot of books. And maybe there is some intuition involved, but largely it is because of careful weighing of facts in order to arrive at a conclusion. As I said, I, I was trained as a doctor, even in the short period that I practiced as a doctor, that's 20 years, I had to handle many crises, and some of them failed. For example, I did a season op operation on a woman who had an ectopic uh, implantation, and uh, the patient died, the baby died. But the husband says thank you. He's quite all right. I don't know what, why he's thanking me, but... <laughs> But there was a crisis because that was a weekend in Alosta when all the doctors, the surgeons, uh, took their, their leave and go to Penang and I was left with my wife to operate. And see, so I had to make a choice. Either I leave this woman to die because she couldn't uh, deliver the baby or I perform a cesarean section. And I took the risk and as you know, it was, well, a bad decision that I made. You cannot always be making a good decision. Sometimes they are bad, sometimes they are good, but you can learn from the bad decisions that you make. Uh, I learned a lot from my own bad decisions and from other b bad decisions made by other people. Uh, we have a policy to look east. Uh, now, of course, Japan is not doing so well. And Japanese asked me, uh, do you still have a look east policy? I said, yes, yes. We still have a look east policy because we want to know what wrong things you did. <laughs> so by and large, I got through 22 years without, well, without being kicked out. I decided to kick myself out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dun, for your answer. So in short, it is always good to learn. Learn from the failure, learn from the winner, learn from an enemy, learn from your friend. Learning is always safe. Next question, please. We have about 10 minutes more before uh, we move on to the next agenda. Yes, right behind there. Thank you. Dun, uh, Dr. Ghazali, I think you know me. Today, crisis that you talk about the 1997, the 2008 uh, crisis, many of us today don't seem to acknowledge that the rules of the game have changed. The nice term they call it the game changer or the sea change because everybody thinks today they want new sense of domination and control in all fronts, whether it's a political, economic, and technology, or even cultural domination. Therefore, how much does our leaders want to understand either they become contribute to human civilization or they destroy civilization? The question would be, as you have seen for 22 years, you tried very hard to tell the world that prosper your neighbor is a fundamental value that humanity is premier to our own longevity. Today, we hear of crisis as a matter of some innovative and competitiveness has an edge, but it destroys humanity in the long run. So my question to our country again, you want to survive, you want to secure, or you want to succeed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, about this uh, slogan that we have, called prosper thy neighbor. Normally, it is beggar thy neighbor. You try to make your, make your neighbors as poor as possible so that you become rich. 
but we discovered that you can make them rich and you become richer. That is why we decided that it's better to prosper the neighbor than to beggar them. When you make them prosperous, for a country that is a trading nation, when you make people prosperous, they can buy more from you. So when you prosper your neighbor, the return is that you become even more prosperous. On the other hand, if your neighbor is having trouble, that trouble will spill over into your country. That is why we adopted this slogan, Prosper Thy Neighbor. And believe me, we have benefited much uh, from this implementation of the, the philosophy behind the Prosper Thy Neighbor idea. But of course, there are people who think about domination and control. Uh, that is because they really cannot manage uh, the problem that they face in their country. Now, if a country uh, is a great producer, producer of weapons, one of the ways to get prosperous is to sell the weapons. But you sell proper weapons which people are not using, then they will not renew, renew their order. And you are coming up with new versions of the weapons which are even more efficacious. So you want them to use the weapons uh, so that they will need to replenish. So if you tell them uh, or instigate war between them and they fight and they use up the weapon, they will need more. And our industries will grow because we produce weapons which we can sell to them. Just imagine a peaceful world. Peaceful world is very dull, no war, no weapons to make, and weapon makers and inventors will have no jobs. So they need to stimulate, uh, well, crises and wars so that they can prosper by selling weapons. So it's quite different from our situation. We don't have weapons to sell. In fact, we buy weapons. We wish this idea about wars are over so that we don't waste money buying weapons. Really, today, despite the financial crisis, they're still spending trillions of dollars on weapons, a waste of money because, by and large, the weapons that are bought are not used. They don't give a return. If you buy them, they don't give a return. So. In, in our case, we want to see the world at peace and prosperous. You know, for a time, China was isolated because it was regarded as a very, um, a very aggressive country. China isolated became very, very poor. But once China understands that to live at peace with your neighbors gives you a lot of benefit, and so they decided that despite communist ideology, they wanted to go into business, trading, etc. And look at China today. It's become a very prosperous nation because it, it produces things that are not for, meant for killing people, but for people to enjoy at a cheap price. I think that is a better philosophy. So as far as Malaysia is is concerned, we don't need control of, of anything outside our country. Inside our country, we need to control a little. Because if we don't control, some of us might decide to go to Syria and join the IS. Yeah. And they are doing it because we don't control. Uh, but by and large, peace gives much more dividends than war. It must be obvious, because during the last war, the victors became poor and uh, defeated the vanquished, like China, like uh, Japan and, and Germany, became very rich. So I think it is better to lose a war than to win a war. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dun. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can afford another question. I have a hand over there. Yes, please. Uh, this morning, we were, uh, we were told very convincingly by the panel of experts that the next global financial crisis will happen as soon as, uh, you know, as two years to five years from now. So my very obvious question to you, do you think the current leadership is equipped to survive us from this crisis? And if not, what is your recommendation? Thank you, Dun. That is what is called a loaded question. <laughs> I, I personally don't like to make any comments. Because people will say, oh, this guy, he thinks he's the only one who knows how to do things. Ah. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't like to make any comments. But I, I must say, as I said just now, that uh, leading a country today requires more skill, more knowledge than in the past. In the past, you deal only with politics. Now you have to deal with the economy, with the finances, and lots of other things. And unless you handle these things properly, you are going to mess up things. So I think uh, you, you have a good chance, I hope, uh, that uh, the present leadership in five years' time will tell the whole world that we are not going your way. Well, thank you very much, Yama Babagia Tun, right on the dot, 6 o'clock. All right, thank you so much, Tun, and thank you, gentlemen, for your questions. But before I invite Tun to leave the stage, I'd like to invite um, Yama Babagia, Tan Sri Vincent Tan, the founder of Bajaya Corporation, to come on stage to join Tun. And uh, I'd like to invite Tan Sri Nick Mohammad Nick Yaakob, the Executive Director of the Dana Leadership Foundation and the uh, Chairman of the Organizing Committee of the CEO Forum 2014, to come on stage as well as uh, Yambu Bahagia Dr. Abdul Rauf Rashid, the uh, country managing partner and the uh, assurance leader ASEAN of uh, Ernst and Yang, or uh, EY, to come on stage to take a photograph with uh, Yang Amab Bahagia Tun. Tan Sri Vincent Tan, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the Jai Corporation is the uh, venue sponsor and the F&B sponsor for this uh, forum, and uh, EY is the main sponsor of this forum. Thank you so much for your contribution to make this forum a success. <laughs>